Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Faith, for that introduction. And um, it is so good just to be able to bring the Word of God to you today. Um, it is an awesome privilege that, um, that I don't take for granted because God has entrusted to us the Word of God. And uh, we live by that. That's our guide. That's what God has left for us so that we can know Him, know about Him, and, um, and be able to follow Him and do what he wants us to do. It's our major guide. He does speak to us individually, of course, and uh, to us as groups, but, uh, but primarily everything kind of um, is based on the Word of God. So it's, uh, it is fantastic. And, um, and so God's integrity, of course, in many ways is based on this. This is the book that, uh, that, that we can read and know how God will respond. Um, so often we know his character, and so we know that when he does things, and we have a history of his workings with, uh, with people all through uh, the, uh, the history of mankind. So it's wonderful. Well, continuing on, a th on the, th the theme of trust. And the first two weeks we looked about trusting God and the aspects of that. And then last week we talked about uh, having integrity and trust. And that we need to be able to be trustworthy to people around, particularly for people that are watching on. And uh, too often the church has been no better than any other uh, organization, whether that's businesses or uh, government um, or whatever it might be, the media. So often um, we have not lived to what we should have done. And so last week we talked about stealing and how easy it is for us to steal and in so many different ways that we steal uh, from others and steal from God, and uh, we looked at the implications of that. So hopefully that was helpful to you uh, last week and something that you can, uh, can look at. And so this week I want to continue with the theme of integrity, um, because integrity is the basis of trust. It is the foundation upon which we build trust for us to be trustworthy. We need to be people of integrity. And so we need to understand that integrity is not something that you slip into. It's not like, oops, I, I accidentally became a person of integrity. Uh, it is a decision that we make for each one of us. We have to decide to be trustworthy. We have to decide to be people that are going to be good. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is goodness. In other words, about us doing the right thing, being good at the very core of our being, because God is good. He's righteous. He does the right thing in every situation, and so we need to do that. So God places a very high value on integrity, and Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 6 says this, Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than he who is crooked, Though he be rich. In other words, it's better to be honest and to be truthful and to, in, in, in our lives to be someone that can be relied on than it is to be rich. The thing is, is we have it the other way around. We think I'd rather be rich at whatever the cost and we lose our integrity and our character is ruined sometimes for life because of the things that we do. So God is saying that integrity, in, integrity is more powerful than the stuff that we think is valuable. And we often think things are valuable, but actually God says, no, actually, this, it's the internal, it's your character that I value more than anything else. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 17 says this, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. So integrity is something that God is, he smiles at, he's happy about. If you want to please God, you need to be a person that can be trusted in every aspect. But it's not only important to God, it is also important to the rest of us. The fact that you are a trustworthy person is important to me, as well as to everyone else, the people in your family, whether it's to your children, whether it's to your spouse, whether it's to your parents, people are looking for you to be a person that can be trusted. 
And so often the problem is, though, is we live with a frustration gap. In other words, we have what we want to be, what we want to do, and what we actually do do. And we find it in our lives that there's this gap between what we, we need to be, what we desire to be, a person of integrity, and yet some of the things that we do. So we say something like this. We say, I don't want to be materialistic, but then we go out and spend a lot of money. We say we want to spend time with our children, but then we say we're too busy. We can't find the time. We say we want to have an important conversation and some intimate relationships with our spouse, but then we, we don't have those conversations for weeks or maybe months on end. So there's often a frustration gap between what we, we want to be and what we are. Now, I just want you to know that, first of all, that you're in good company because some of the brilliant, most brilliant people in the world in history have already also struggled with this. For example, one of the greatest guys in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, an intellectual genius, a man of immense integrity, integrity said this. He said that actually I struggle because in Romans 7, verses 18, 20 says, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. I want to do good, but I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. Is there anyone that feels the same as that? That has that same frustration gap that the Apostle Paul, mighty man of God, that had amazing revelations from God, who we would all look up to as Christians, as someone to follow in his, in, in his integrity and in the way he lived, says this even a few verse, verses later. He says, I don't understand myself at all. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like that so often. There is this Frustration gap, and often in many areas of our life, we struggle with it. Now, we're used to thinking of integrity, where integrity when it's business, or when it's finance, or when it's to do with politics, but today I want to particularly hone in on personal integrity. Because personal integrity is a foundation to all other integrity. So if you want to be trustworthy, if you want to have a trustworthy church, trustworthy business, a trustworthy family, if you want to have trust in your sphere of life, then you need to personally be a person of integrity. Yes? So the real value of integrity for relationships is that it has the massive power to build trust in our relationships. It fuels trust. It fuels our relationships and the benefits of it. So the benefits are, there's many benefits to, uh, to being trustworthy. Uh, the first one, of course, is protection. So if you are in a relationship that you trust one another, you're with someone that you know you can trust, it gives you that, that, that protection in the relationship, knowing that you have nothing to fear. You don't need to fear in this relationship, Yes. And so, of course, we also know that from Psalm 25, verse 21 says this, that we can feel God's protection because of our integrity. He says this, may integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. So, in other words, our integrity is the foundation of our life. Secondly, the second benefit is not only that we have less fear in a relationship, but we have greater confidence. We have a sense of security in our relationships. Proverbs 10 and verse 9 says, The man of integrity walks securely. You can live not feeling insecure. You can feel secure because of your integrity. Thirdly, not only do we that, but we are able, because of our integrity, to make better decisions. It, integrity gives us a sort of internal guidance system so that we, you and I can make good decisions. Proverbs 11 and verse 3 says this, 
the integrity of the upright guides them. It's a guide. You know the right thing to do. So when you put these three, three things together, protection, security, and guidance, you've got a great foundation for any relationship. If only we could be a people of integrity. So it strengthens our relationships, whether that's at home, whether that's at work, whether it's in our connect group, whether it's in a ministry that we're serving in. Now today I wanted to talk about how we can, some practical things about how we can be a people of integrity. I had four things planned to speak honestly, to stay humble, to stay faithful, and to stay dependent on Jesus. However, the more I looked at it, I realized I'm only going to probably cover one. So you might be glad that you'll get home before dinner time. But, it, but these, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, and that's not all, and what I'm saying is, is that integrity is based on a number of things. And it comes out through being honest. comes out through being people of faithfulness. People who, uh, who, who you know, trust God and depend on God would do that. Now, <clears throat> Mark Twain said this. If you tell the truth, you don't have to s- remember anything. In other words, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember it because it's, you just told the truth. So all you have to do is remember what the truth was. Very easy, isn't it? If you tell lies, then you've got to remember what the lie was that you told. Now, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, but I'm sure you all have heard the phrase, honesty is the best policy. The problem is most of us have thrown the policy away. (laughs) We've discarded that policy because we don't tell the truth. Yes. And so I know that some of you are thinking, yes, I know it's a matter of integrity, but uh, for me, it's not about integrity. It's about survival. (laughs) If I tell the truth, (laughs) I'll get into trouble. But we'll come on to that in a second. So let's be honest about honesty, that integrity and honesty are a risk. They're a risk in every relationship. It's a risk whether you tell the truth, and it's a risk if you tell a lie. So I want to talk about speaking the truth, being honest, speaking honestly to one another today. So the question is, where do lies come from? They come from the library. Uh, Is that too good for you? Library. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay. That's the best that it gets. So Psalm 34 says this. Would you like to enjoy life? Do you want long life and happiness? Then keep from speaking evil and from telling lies. The question is, why do we tell lies? And there's a number of different motivations that lie behind the reason for our lies. So lying, in other words, is just a symptom of a deeper problem. Yes, Augustine said that there are eight types of lie. Mark Twain said there are 869 kinds of lies. But today, you might be glad, I'm only going to cover about five different types of lie. And so the first lie I want to look at is the cruel lie. This is where you are intentionally destructive and malicious. It's where you want revenge. You've been hurt, and so you misrepresent someone. Yes, you make up a lie about them. The Sadducees did this to Jesus because they wanted him to be crucified on the cross. So the motive is revenge. The motive is is resentment for this kind of lie. Satan did this in Genesis chapter 3 when he lied to Eve. Did God really say this? You know, will you not be? And so he deceived Eve and he lied. Why? Because he wanted to have a go at God. He wanted revenge against God. And what about Potiphar's wife? When she lied to her husband about Joseph, she had... Um, she had Uh, tried to get Joseph uh, to go to bed with her 
And when he refused, he ran for his life, left his cloak behind, but she turned it and twisted it to get revenge and said to her husband that this slave that you brought into my house, he has... Uh, he tried to take advantage of me, but when I screamed, which she didn't, a blatant lie, when I screamed, um, uh, he fled for his life. And so he ended up in prison, all for doing the right thing. So we see there that we, can, that we have uh, this cruel type. And some people, and for, I'm sure uh, we, we do that, but that's the motive behind it. The second type of lie is the cowardly lie. This is a lie when we fear the consequences of telling the truth. There's a risk to tell the truth. There's, of course, a risk in not telling the truth. The risk in telling the truth, maybe to someone, could be that they would blow up and there would be a conflict. There'd be an argument going on. But on the other hand, the risk of not telling the truth is that down the line, things open up, your relationship grows apart, and there becomes problems later on. Genesis chapter 20, the first 13 verses there, we read about Abraham emigrating and he tells everyone that his wife is his sister. Well, in fact, she was his sister. Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. Same dad, different mother. But you see, what he neglected to say was that Sarah was his wife. So he told a half-truth. He didn't fully tell the whole truth. You know, when you go to court, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, yes? So in other words, we've got to be full disclosure is what we need. So that's the, that's the problem so often, is we, um, we don't tell it because we are scared of conflict. And so... Abram was scared of the consequences of telling the truth. And, uh, and Genesis chapter 20 uh, is really quite a powerful uh, time there. And um, if I will just quickly turn to it, turn to it, Genesis chapter 20. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and chapter 20 is the 20th chapter in the book. <laughs> um, and he's talking about. He moved to, he says, now Abram moved on from there into the region of Negev, and, um, and for a while he stayed there, and there Abram said to his wife Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Ge- uh, Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. He wanted to marry her. Yes, she was a stunningly beautiful woman. And so he was scared that somebody would do him over to be able to have his wife. But you know, God speaks to Abimelech in the night and tells him what's going on. And Abimelech is really repentant. In fact, he, he never did anything wrong. Um, he, you know, but Abram lightens. So Abram put Abimelech in a bad situation, yes? And thankfully, God restored that. Now, that's not the first time Abram does that. Abram has done it previously. That's twice. Abram lies about his wife being. Uh, not, not being his wife. He just does, it's not full disclosure, yes? And what about Genesis chapter 37, a few, verse, a few chapters further on? Jacob's son lied to Joseph because they, have, they despised Joseph and so they, uh, they sold him to the slaves and, um, and, uh, uh, to go to Egypt. And so as a result of that, they think, to us, how can we cover up what we've done And so what they do is they kill an animal, put some bloodstains on his clothes, on his multicolored coat, and take it back to his father and say, is this your son's, knowing full well that it was. And also allowing uh, Jacob to actually believe that his son was dead and being devoured. That's a lie. It's deceptive. It's not telling the truth, the whole truth, the full truth. Is doing that. And so I'm sure for all of us, when it comes to conflict, we're all yellow bellied (laughs) chickens, aren't we? We we try to avoid conflict at all costs, and so often we are willing to lie as a result of that. You see, we lie to escape consequences, punishment, pain, 
You know, things like, the dog ate my homework. Yes, the motive is fear. We're trying to get out of doing that. The, the fear of people is a trap. And yet we go along to get along. And we see it all the time. Kids brag about it. Oh, I've done this and done that, whatever, which they haven't done because of peer pressure, because they want to look cool. The third type of lie is the conceited lie. This is because of our insecurity. We lie to impress. We lie to create an image. We lie um, because we're by bragging about something. So easy to do. The motive, of course, is insecure. We feel we have to puff ourselves up in order to look better. And uh, I was reading something this, this, uh, this week and it said the, the, the time when most people are the most perfect in their life is when they're writing their CV. <laughs> so in other words, when we're writing, we're trying, to, we're trying to brag, we're using everything, oh, am I good at this and am I good at that? And so uh, we, uh, we are trying to, uh, to, li- to make people feel this big. You know, the fish was this big. Yeah. And he get, every time you tell the story, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The next one is calculated lie. This is a lie to manipulate. This is a lie to sell something or to get something by manipulation. It's a lie that we try to cover something up. It's based on greed. It's based on selfishness. So in other words, Saul lies to David about marrying his daughter Merab. And so he promised David his daughter's hand in marriage but when, and said to him, well, I'll tell you what, you can marry my daughter on the condition that you do this, this and this. And so David, poof, off he goes and does it as a mighty man of valor. Um, and so he comes back. But when he comes back, it says, and it was the time, verse 19 says, so when the time came for Merab, Saul's daughter to be, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel, of Mehola. Don't you just hate it when that happens? <laughs> but Saul was lying. Lying, blatantly lying, trying to cover up from that. It's, a, it's because of greed. I mean, the amount of times that I have talked to people on a practical note about tithing. I said, well, are you tithing? We do a wedding, you say, are you tithing? Joining a ministry, are you tithing? Leading something, are you tithing? Are you doing? You know, we just ask it. It's part of one of our calls. And people say to us, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when we look at what they give, it is clear, without a doubt, they are not tithing. They are being deceitful. They're lying to us. Why? Because the only reason to not tithe is because of greed and selfishness and lack of trusting God in what they're doing. It's a blatant lie. And the motive is greed and selfishness, a lack of trust in God. If you don't trust God... Why should we trust you? Because he's the one that makes any of us trustworthy. On the same line, Ananias and Sapphira are in Acts chapter 5. They're a husband and wife team and they sell their property. They didn't have to sell their property. But at that time in chapter 4 we read that, uh, that the people were selling their extra homes and all sorts of things that they had in order to bring it into the pot to care for the widows to care for the poor, uh, to be able to, to, for the apostles to be able to distribute. There was a real heart of, of togetherness and unity. And so they brought, that, brought it together. And so this is what they did. But then they came to Peter. Ananias came to Peter, having discussed it uh, with Sapphira and said, okay, we sold it for whatever, it doesn't say the figures, but let's say we sold it for £100,000. But actually, let's tell them we sold it for £50,000 so that then we, do, you know, we can keep some to ourselves. Now, if they'd have been open and honest, there wouldn't have been a problem, but they didn't, you see. They were deceitful with it. And so when, uh, when Ananias came uh, to Peter and told him this, Peter said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied, you have made a pact with your, uh, with your wife, and as he spoke, Ananias died on the spot. That's serious, isn't it? Yes? So Peter said that. Then in comes Sapphira, not knowing anything about what had just happened, and she repeats the lie, and Peter says the same, and she also dies. 
And the text says, and there was great fear among all the believers and, of course, people around. People were scared to join the church because of the power of God. So what I'm saying to you, God takes lying seriously. Yes? As is demonstrated from that. Now, thankfully, we, God doesn't kill us when we lie. And not every time we lie. But we need to be very careful of what we are doing. Because who is listening to every lie? The Holy Spirit is listening to every lie. And it's affecting your character. Another lie is called the convenient lie. This is usually down to laziness. So it's something kind of like we don't want to get involved. So we see an accident and we say, no officer, I never saw a thing. Why? Because we don't want to get involved. We don't want to have to put the time in and to stay around and whatever. Or we say things like, you look great in that dress. Okay, don't get there, Jonathan. Okay, that's maybe a bit too risky. But often we lie because we're too lazy to check the facts. Often referred to as diplomacy. Yes, we don't want to offend. So we say things like, sorry, I can't make the Connect group tonight. I'm not feeling well. Oh, sometimes people just say, I'm not, I can't make Connect group with no explanation. Nothing. And you think to yourself, okay, we know you're not coming, but we don't know why. That doesn't build trust. Yeah? Because all of us are asking, well, why are you not coming? Why are you not coming? Is there a problem? Is there something we need to know about? Is it, do you just not want to come? Or are you at work? Are you not well? Is there, do, you, do you know what I'm trying to say? Is there, and some are the excuses that I have heard for people not coming to church or coming to Connect Group. You, it would fill a book. Because people's creativity comes out when it comes to making excuses. But it's still a lie, isn't it? How come some people can be virtually 100% consistent in turning up and other people rarely make it? They've nearly every week there's an excuse. Why? Well, because there's a deceitfulness, there's a lack of integrity of saying, been understanding because they're just sheer lazy. They don't feel like going, oh, I'm tired. If we didn't do something because we're tired, we'd never do anything. But it's amazing when they want to watch a film on the television, they can stay up till all hours. They can do all sorts of things. You, you know, invite them to a party. Invite them to a... They don't miss that. And so we've got to understand that, that it's important for us to be consistent in our faith in our walk with God, that we turn up. When we say we're going to turn up, we turn up. We're men of our word. That Our mouth is saved. Yes, our mouth is saved. Our, our mouth is righteous. Our mouth is godly. Our mouth can be trusted. You are a man of your word. You are a promise keeper. You say something and you do it. Now, I know there's times when we say, yes, we'll do something and we can't do it for some, some reason or other. But generally, what I'm saying is the intention of the heart. The intention matters. And I haven't got full time to go into the intention, but the intention matters. So let us ask God for the courage to tell the truth. Let's ask God for the, the, the courage to take the risks to be people of honour. Amen? So how should we tell the truth? Very quickly, I'll go through these. How to tell the truth. The first thing to do is to tell the truth completely. And hopefully you've got that so far. Proverbs 10 and verse 10 says, Someone who holds back the truth causes trouble. Hold the truth back, you're a troublemaker. Yes? And of course, we know that with Abram and Sarah we talked about. Yes, he held the truth back and it caused trouble. In the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. Proverbs 28. It might be unpleasant at first. They might not like what you've said, but they'll, they'll trust you because you're a person of the truth. Secondly, tell the truth consistently. Yes? No, in other words, don't be honest 80% of the time. Because if you're honest 80% of the time, you are a dishonest person. You can't just tell, well, a majority of the time what I say is true. If you've got somebody in your life that, well, most of what they say is true, 80% of what they're true, what happens is you start to disbelieve everything because of the 20% or the 10% or the 5%, whatever it might be, 
Trust has to be that you are 100% a person of integrity. Ephesians 4 verse 15 in the Amplified says this, Let our lives lovingly express the truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, and living truly. Proverbs 11, people who can't be trusted are destroyed by their own dishonesty. If you want to live a successful, blessed life, you want to be all that God wants you to be, you have got to be a person who can be trusted. Lying sabotages success. Lying destroys relationships. Lying will destroy your character. Every relationship around you is built on trust. Deception destroys trust. Dishonesty will reduce your friendships. You won't have many friends if you are dishonest. Thirdly, tell the truth lovingly. Speak the truth in a spirit of love, Ephesians 4. Speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who who live in. Ephesians 4, 29. Ask yourself, when you are doing something, when you're trying to be honest, ask yourself, am I being honest? Do I want that person's best interest or do I want my interest so often we're looking for something because of what's in it for me so we often um, you know don't tell the truth or we tell the truth in a wrong way and it all depends on what's the thing fourthly tell the truth tactfully thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword but wisely spoken words can heal Proverbs 16, intelligent people think before they speak. Ecclesiastes 8, there is a right time and a right way to do everything. In other words, when you're tired last thing at night, it's not the time to bring up an issue. (laughs) Yes, because that's when if you bring something up then, you're not at your best. Cook him a meal first. Make sure he's... Oh, buy her some flowers before, whatever it might be. You see, the real problem is said in Matthew 12, verse 34. This is such a short thing, but it just speaks volumes. It shows the real problem. It says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus said that what's in your heart will come out of your mouth so the heart of the issue is the human heart the heart of your issues is your heart you see what's in your heart if you're filled with resentment you'll find yourself telling lies if you're filled with fear and worry you'll find yourself telling cowardly lies if you're filled with insecurity you'll find yourself telling conceited lies if your heart is filled with selfishness you'll be telling calculated lies. And if your heart is filled with laziness, you'll be telling convenient lies. So the question is, what is the solution? The only way to stop lying is to get a new heart. And Jesus is in the business of giving us a new heart. He wants to restore us. He wants to do something new. And every day you can be there. God wants to come and you might say, well, I gave my heart to Jesus Uh, such and such a time I want to say to you every day God is looking for you to come to him because if you will run to him he will do what only he can do I want to tell you the truth is a person the truth is Jesus Christ the closer you get to Jesus the closer you will get to truth the closer you will be true the more you will be a person of integrity the more you walk with God you walk close with God you spend time the Holy Spirit will fill you with truth yes he will fill you with integrity he will fill you so that you can be trustworthy person God is a God of integrity God is a God who can be trusted and he wants every one of us to be trusted and he wants to give us a new heart it's the only way today you can't change yourself you haven't got the power to change yourself you haven't got the willpower to do it you might do it short term but I want to tell you it's what's in your heart and God wants to change your heart will you let God change your heart today I believe God wants us to do that and so I'm just going to hand over now just for us to really contemplate some things about breaking the habit of lying for some of us there's a habit of lying 
There are certain lies that we keep saying on and on and on. We've got to change that. We've got to change. God is looking for change. He loves us too much for us to stay the same. Today, will you turn to God? Will you say to God, Lord, today I want to stop lying. Today I want to be a man or a woman of integrity. I want, to, I want my word to be my bond. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to change my heart, to give me a new heart, to give me a security that comes from you, to give me, Lord Jesus, that, that whole essence that comes from the inside. Change me, Lord, from the inside out so that I can truly be who you want me, me to be. Today I pray that as God has spoken to you, that you will respond with a heart of humility because God is looking for humility. Pride is such a, 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 a thing. God hates pride and yet he loves humility. And he's going to take humility to, to, to say to God, Lord, I'm a liar and I want to stop being a liar and today I want to have a new heart. If you will pray that prayer today, it will change your life forever.